On today's episode, we have good news and bad news about America's moon landings, followed by some explosive new details on the SpaceX Starship. For the first time in five decades, America has a lot of stuff happening on the moon, and it's a real mixed bag this week. But first, you gotta check this out. This is a video of a drill breaking through the surface of the moon. Is that not the coolest thing? Okay, so let's do bad news. Intuitive Machines is an American aerospace company based out of Houston, Texas. Last year, they became the first private company to land on the moon, even though their Nova Sea lander ended up sideways. And last week, Intuitive Machines became the first private company to land on the moon twice. And this time, they are yet again, unfortunately, resting in the sideways configuration. On March 6th, the lander, named Athena, began a slow and deliberate landing procedure. The craft had orbited the moon 39 times while identifying a well-lit and even landing site on the lunar south pole region, on the top of a flat hill known as Mons Mouton. Everything appeared to be going well, until it wasn't. On the livestream presentation, we saw the lander slowly descend down to the surface under autonomous guidance, and this looked good up until the final touchdown maneuver, when all of the telemetry data from the probe suddenly went haywire. At two minutes before the scheduled touchdown, the animation of the lander changes scenes from the moon to the middle of outer space, and then the altitude begins to rapidly plummet until it starts to read negative negative numbers, then it jumps back up to 5 kilometers altitude, even though we can hear from the chatter in Mission Control that they believe the lander is already on the ground. Everyone involved appeared to be pretty confused about what just happened. Luckily, that confusion was cleared up shortly after. In a follow-up press conference, Intuitive Machines described a problem with the laser altimeter, saying that it was quote, noisy data all the way until touchdown. You might remember that the laser altimeter played an important role in the first Intuitive Machines landing last year, which is to say that it didn't play any role at all. The device was rendered useless after someone forgot to remove the protective cover before launching the rocket, so it was kind of believed that if Intuitive Machines had that laser, then they would probably have had a better landing result. Turns out, not so much. The company also cleared up some confusion about how long the engine remained on after landing. Even some people at Mission Control on the live stream seemed to believe that the lander's main engine was still firing after it had reached the surface, but it turns out that this was just a false reading created by leftover gas in the combustion chamber. In a second update on March 7th, Intuitive Machines finally confirmed that the Athena lander was resting on its side. And as we can see from the photo they released, this happened in the worst possible location. Athena is tipped over in the bottom of a shallow crater. Even still, the company has written on X that they have executed the southernmost lunar landing to date, and operated payloads. Intuitive Machines says that the location where they ended up is 250 meters away from their targeted landing zone. In a separate statement released by NASA, however, they wrote that Athena was 400 meters away from the intended landing site. But everyone seems to agree that less than 24 hours after making contact with the moon, Athena's mission has reached a premature end. In the moon's south pole region, the sunlight is always coming in from a very low angle, so this shadow that we're seeing surrounding Athena is not going away, and that means that the solar panels can't possibly generate enough power to operate the mission. NASA did confirm that they were able to accelerate the testing of their Prime 1 payload before Athena croaked, and that included the Trident Drill and M-Solo mass spectrometer. NASA says that the drill was able to successfully demonstrate a full range of motion in the harsh environment of space. This is not the same drill that we saw at the beginning of the video. Due to Athena's sideways orientation, the Trident drill was just kind of uselessly thrusting out into open space and not actually accomplishing anything, which is a shame. Anyway, on to the positive news. The Firefly Aerospace Blue Ghost lander successfully touched down on the moon last week, and 
And in fairness to intuitive machines, this should not be looked at like a direct comparison. It doesn't necessarily mean that Firefly is better, because Blue Ghost is landed in the northern hemisphere of the moon, in what's considered to be a very safe location. It's pretty close to where human beings have walked on the moon. While the intuitive machine's attempt at landing on the South Pole Aiken Basin was a significantly more risky play, that landscape is very rough and uneven and has to deal with this extreme low light from the sun. In the time since Blue Ghost came online, we have been treated to a pretty fantastic display of science in action on the lunar surface. This is the Lunar Planet Vac going in for its first sample. You can see that burst of compressed air because you can't actually use a vacuum in a vacuum. So the instrument is blasting that dust and regolith up into itself to collect a sample. Then we have the Lunar Magnotelluric Sounder, which kind of looks like throwing the first pitch on the moon. It's casting out four tethered electrodes onto the surface, and then extending an 8-foot mast above the lander platform. These will actually allow NASA to study the deep interior of the moon to learn about its structure. And this is the Lunar Instrument for Subsurface Thermal Exploration with Rapidity. It's a small drill that is breaking through the surface. Check out how the rocks kind of snap and crackle like sparks. And this is going to allow them to measure the flow of heat through the interior of the moon. Firefly has also been releasing these behind the scenes videos featuring their engineers and flight technicians. And it's just been really cool to share this moment of triumph with all of the people who made it happen. Unfortunately, some of the most exciting lunar payloads this year were attached to the intuitive machine's Athena lander. It was carrying a wheeled rover and a hopper drone, which we will never get to see in action. Speaking of action though, how about that Starship Flight 8? While we still can't say for sure what exactly led to yet another explosive demise of the ship's upper stage, we have been getting some alleged information in the form of what appears to be leaks coming from inside SpaceX. Now, we're leaving this to the end because it could be total nonsense. But here's what we're looking at right now. We've got this image that appears to have been taken from within the Starship engine bay on Flight 8, and it shows one of the Raptor vacuum engines that's just totally missing, along with one of the center boost engines which appears to be gone as well. That shouldn't come as a shocking revelation given that we saw an explosion happen in the base of the Starship as the engines began to drop out from the telemetry feed. But to see that it was literally blown to smithereens, that's pretty crazy. Now, the same anonymous leaker who provided the image also released some information about the cause of the failure and what it means for the future of Starship. It does not paint a good picture. It says that the same issue that destroyed Flight 7 was repeated on Flight 8. Harmonic oscillations in the vacuum insulated fuel lines for the Raptor Vac engines. These fuel lines feed down from the upper methane tank through the oxygen tank and into the engine. The leak claims that the failure of Flight 8 was even more destructive than what happened on Flight 7, indicating that the measures SpaceX took to solve the problem actually made it worse. And then they shed some light on a theory that's been going around the internet. It's one that makes a lot of sense to me at least, basically saying that as the oxygen tank empties, the vibrations of the fuel lines increase, because the liquid is acting as a damper. This is why SpaceX's one minute static fire test didn't prove anything because they didn't empty the fuel tank. Also, the resonance of an object in a vacuum will be a lot different than its resonance in an atmosphere. The strength of the vibration leads to breaks in the lower parts of the fuel lines, right where the main wiring for the Raptor Vac engine is located. Leaks also caused the engine's regenerative cooling system to malfunction, which led to the explosion during the fire in the compartment. The leak also includes some interesting side notes, such as claiming that the hot stage separation also aggravates the situation in the engine compartment. So, 
if true, then this is a fundamental miscalculation in the design of Starship V2 and its engine section. And that makes the fate of the following two Starship vehicles, which have already been constructed, very unclear. They either need a design revision or they will have to be scrapped entirely. This could lead to a pause in Starship production as the thrust section is redesigned, and it would be a relatively large setback in the rocket's development timeline. Again, Nothing about that should be taken too seriously, but it's definitely something that's interesting to think about.